It is time for another episode of One Soccer Today for this final day in the month of September, the National Day Ooh. for Truth and Reconciliation here in Canada. It's Adam Jenkins, Jordan Wilson, and Oliver Platt with you. Our typical start to the show on a Monday, as always, a look back to what took place in the Canadian Premier League, albeit in about 30 minutes from now, Valor will be kicking off against Pacific. So it will be uh, an abbreviated CPL recap because we just don't know what's going to happen in the final match of match week 25. Though some things, gentlemen, certainly did get a little clear, especially with Forge. They now just need two points to secure the CPL shield. They can do it with a win, speaking of Valor, in Winnipeg next match week but they were in action against york united a heavily rotated york united group with injuries with three players away due to suspension trying to do something they haven't done and, and i certainly can't remember how long and that's beat forge certainly at tim horton's fields uh that cpl shield berth of course would get them back into Concacaf champions cup and really one of the main takeaways is that york were poor cavalry didn't take advantage of vancouver outside of the playoffs with a nil nil draw there and atletico ottawa dropped points to the halifax wanderers a late goal from nasim mekidesh uh, what's your biggest takeaway and i'll start with you jordan wilson from those big stories from this weekend in the cpl the biggest story for me is forge have won the shield um a lot of teams are tying. There's a lot of parity within the league. I spoke on match night yesterday on how well they've recruited Forge. But for me, they've just been uh, the most consistent and best team in the Canadian Premier League. And they've won it. I know not mathematically. And people are going to say, well, it's not over yet. They've won it. But it is over. <laughs> it, it, it's it. done. They, they need two points to secure it. They have three matches left. The team below them in Athletic Ottawa, they play in a week's time it's theirs they've won it it's now really figuring out who's going to be the team to to catch them and make it difficult for them and i've even asked a few forge players like who would you want to play like who th no team threatens them they're like whoever comes in second we feel like we can pack them up and send them back nicely and the underdog in me is just like calvary Atletico, ottawa york you know that you're making playoffs now build a lineup Build a 15, 14 player that you know that can, you can trust that can go in on that run and go in and, and give them a game. Because, yeah, the double sounds nice, but I don't want the double just handed to them. They have the shield and then the North Star Cup. You know that Forge is a big, big game team. But I want a team to go out and take it. Go take the cup. Go. Don't let Forge just go and clean up the double easily. Nice. They already walk around, rightfully so with a certain swagger and, a, and a, I'll say a, a nice tad bit of arrogance. And they're just going to go and win the double easy like that. Winning the shield with, with three games left or probably two games left, that's one thing. But please, someone out there, whether it's a fifth place team, make it difficult for Forge. Grab the cup from them. Don't let it just be so easy that they go and win that double. That's the biggest oh, thing. Yeah. 34 points is now a new club record for Forge. In you look at the table... 11 1 and 1 at home for me that was the biggest reason i thought somebody other than forge needed to win the shield because beating them in that one two playoff game to host the final is going to be immensely difficult and they did it like clockwork it was a very um suffocating performance against York United despite what Ben I mean Moore had available for selection uh, you're more than welcome to tag in on the fact that Forge has all but claimed the shield but if there's another CPL storyline I'd also be happy to entertain that well I'll, I'll chime in on that one first because the storyline as you guys have alluded to now becomes can this become the first team to do the double uh, as Cavalry looks like they would have a big opportunity to do last season and I guess the difference there is that Forge have obviously been there and done it in the playoffs. Cavalry were trying to get that over the line for the first time, but it's the nature of this league and the format that's been created, and I think it's very good, a uh, very good thing, that if you win that Shield, you're, you're two home wins away from claiming the North Star Cup as well. So the Shield is the one for me that is very difficult to win, the most difficult to win, and still this season... Again, uh, no one in the in, in the CPL has been, been, been able to repeat back-to-back -back with winning the regular season. But then it puts you in a fantastic position for, for the playoffs as well. So it's kind of reminds me a little bit of, of the NFL when you see these these top teams like New England and Kansas City who can finish top of, of the conference and then end up with two home games to go to the Super Bowl. And the CPL Shield puts you in a similar position uh, in our playoffs as well. So Forger are in with a fantastic opportunity here. 
um, to, to make it a double for the first time in CPR history. The other thing that goes in with this conversation about maybe Forge's biggest threat to the double is also the team that's going to finish second, not just to have a chance to play that 1v2 match, but if Forge do the double, then it would be the second place team in the regular season that would get the second Canadian Premier League CONCACAF Champions Cup spot. So it is absolutely crucial for all of these teams to go in there and do that. Okay, covering off those stories, uh, or the story, I suppose, the lead story, let's spend a bit more time in the Canadian Premier League here. How about I ask you this question, Oliver Platt, when it comes to Atletico Ottawa and Cavalry, who are you most disappointed in from their draw this week? Is it Cavalry for not scoring a goal, or is it Atletico Ottawa for not being able to see it out against the Halifax Wanderers? Uh, it's Cavalry because I thought, I just didn't think they played particularly well in that game. I know Tommy Wood and Junior disagreed and, and didn't mind the performance. I, I felt they just kind of lost their rhythm in that game. It became too individualistic. Uh, they started the game well, should have taken the lead, should have had a penalty. But from there, I didn't think they were at their best. And, and that's kind of like more broadly, you look at the chasing pack right now. Uh, in the last five games for each team, the only teams to have won more than one of their past five games are Forge and Pacific. Um, and you have three teams trying to challenge Forge that have failed to, to, to in the end to challenge Forge who are kind of stumbling in, into the playoffs right now. Um, so as much as York United have been one of the worst form teams in the league over the past few weeks, they're still in it for second place. Like they're, they're, they're not out of this race at all as much as we might talk about Atletico Otter and Cavalry uh, as the two favorites for, for that position. The other thing I'd say is that if you finish fifth in this league and you come into the playoffs with momentum, mm -hmm you got to be looking at the teams above you and thinking they're very beatable right now. Uh, or at the very least, we can get a result and maybe take it to, to extra time or penalties. So um, we'll see in, in the last few weeks of the season if any one of those three teams can can really find a bit of form and, and make themselves look like the strongest contender to challenge Forge because I think you'd struggle to pick between them right now. Jordan, do you agree that you were more disappointed in Cavalry or do you think um, you want to go the other way with your former club in York United for really not challenging Forge? Um, I'm going to go with Atletico Ottawa, truthfully. Mm. Um, for me, I, th I think you want to close that gap. Even if you're going to come in second, you want to make put that pressure. I think they've made it far too easy for Forge. I can understand a situation where you're up 2-1 at Atco Field against Calvary, and then they come back and tie it 2-2. And I think on a away performance, you take that point. Sometimes that's what it is in this league and in football. Cool. I'm okay with that one. Pacific? Playing Pacific at home and you you score in the 29th minute. Sissoko scores a beautiful, well-worked goal from Atletico Ottawa. Come out second half for me, just a little bit flat, but then end that game 1-1. Um, that's a missed opportunity. This past weekend, this is the best football that I've seen Atletico Ottawa play. Best half all season. They were, look at this goal. All the the, the Avengers united. You have Balut Tabla on the ball, <laughs> Finder Manu Aparicio, clip ball in. Find did it just strong head score boom. They should have had maybe two or three goals in the first half. Now, if you don't put a team away in the first half, make sure that you don't allow them back into the game. And that's exactly what they did with Halifax Wanderers. I will say Halifax, I'll give them credit. They were better in the second half. But again, Mechadesh right here with that goal to tie it up. But look, that's a 79th minute. That piece I'm like, can we put teams to bed? You the three points that are right there on the table to put a little bit of pressure on Forge, you just, guys just missed the opportunity. When that goal went in, Mekadesh scored. I said, look at that. You guys just, in, in respect, just gave the shield to Forge. There, there was no pressure. There was no clawing. There was no, hey, we're going to nip at your heels. And, and for me, when you're going to chase the best team in the league, you have to put that pressure. But they didn't. So I think that's just a disappointing thing. I know Atletico is maybe going to compare to last season and say we finished sixth. And now we're in second and we have a potential to go and host the final. That's fine. But I think the way that you're doing that, this this could have been better. They have enough. Look at the players on the squad. Look at the team that they started with, Atletico Ottawa. That's more than enough to go and finish off at Halifax Wanderers yesterday. But they, again, a missed opportunity. And Ali, you think about the gap between them all. 40 points in second for Atletico Ottawa, only 39 for Cavalry, so just one point there. York United starting to fall adrift of York United by four points with only three matches remaining. So it's obviously a, a big race for the second spot now, now that we know that this, the shield is all but secured. How about this? And this will be the last question before we move on to other topics on the day. Um, off the board a little bit. 
with the teams that are still chasing Pacific Vancouver, Halifax, Valor, we know we'll get a pretty uh, good answer in about two hours time here, but just quickly of the, of the teams we've seen play already this weekend, is there anyone you're thinking, okay, fifth seems likely for them because to me, Vancouver were sure satisfied with the draw, but they didn't really show much, especially with how much tinkering they've done with the roster Um, cavalry with the way that they played and couldn't finish look to be, open to some kind of an upset Halifax. It takes the late set piece to get them back in. We know that Ottawa are finding their form and Halifax are pesky, but are you any closer? I guess is what I'm asking to having a, an idea of who that fifth spot should belong. No. To? No. <laughs> um, I, I like, I thought Vancouver were better defensively. I don't think they're completely out of this yet. Um, I think they will know going into these final few games that they've just got to find a way to grind it out. And sometimes that can make teams dangerous. I, on on paper, when I look on paper, I think Halifax, who are hanging around, are a strong team. Um, with Mekadesh coming in, with Raya coming in, players like Caligari and Ferran, I think finding more like the the form we saw last season's health has been very good. I think for a number of weeks now, so they'd be the one I think looks strongest on paper. But obviously, still with a little bit of a deficit to make up uh, for Pacific, who who play a massive one very shortly. Jordan, do you agree? Yeah. I do. I think, yeah, the the match that on Monday night, it, it is huge because for me, Val have played good football, but they need three points to really make this interesting. And then I'm also just selfishly thinking about the league and the outcome and that it's a proper league now. Everyone playing on the at the same time uh, on what would be heartbreaking for some teams. It's, it's going to be great. But I think what's going to make that great if, is if Val win tonight. Get those three points, make that nice little sandwich, because then you're looking at the last two, three matches and how important that's going to be uh, for the league and for the outcome. So Pacific, they get three points a day. They are in that spot and and someone that's has true. to knock them out. But Valor does, it It could be anyone's game. And that's what I want. I want those four teams to really push for it at the end of the season. That's right. The outcome presented by Tony Betts Saturday, October the 19th. That is less than three weeks away. All four matches available for free on the One Soccer YouTube channel and all happening simultaneously with some really, really interesting matches, surely. Hopefully, everyone's hope is that there is a lot to play for on the final day that will make some quad screen viewing uh, very, very important. Let's move on to Major League Soccer. We'll start with Toronto FC, who are trying to get themselves into a playoff position. We have outlined in the past how the schedule isn't necessarily their friend in terms of the fact that they will be the first team in Major League Soccer to finish their campaign. And Oliver Platt, we're looking at what they had ahead, understanding it was an emotional week with the loss in the Canadian Championship. But they're playing Chicago Fire, who are awful. And you're thinking, okay, this is an opportunity for them. Lorenzo Insigne doesn't start the match. He comes in off the bench, has a chance to shoot, has a chance to score and take three points home to Toronto. And he passes the ball and TFC has to settle for a draw. Uh, This result obviously made worse by the fact that San Jose might be as awful, if not more awful than the Chicago Fire. But Montreal took care of business in their match, giving them some of the onus <laughs> back in the playoff race. Who They still sit in eighth due to the total wins tiebreaker, even though TFC have played more. Um, who's more likely to make the playoffs, Oliver Plot? Is it Toronto? Is it Montreal? Has to be Montreal at this point. Just look, it, TFC's schedule is, is a tough one to judge because on paper it looks very difficult. Red Bulls and into Miami, but into Miami could be preparing for the playoffs by the time that co- game comes around. So you don't know exactly what kind of uh, what kind of opposition lineup you're going to get. Uh, Montreal again on paper look like they have much winnable games. Atlanta and Charlotte coming up next to are both kind of middling teams in that Eastern Conference. So um, Montreal have the momentum. They maybe have a bit of a schedule advantage and they're just starting to look like a team that's, that's figuring a few things out. Caden Clark has come in and, and made a massive impact in this yeah, team. We're, we're seeing young players like Nathan Saliba come into their own. Uh, and it looks like after that really horrible periods they had after the, the League's Cup, a couple of terrible results coming back from that tournament, that they've found answers to, to some of the things that were, were obviously holding them back during that period and, and are starting to really find some confidence and momentum here. So just on that basis, I think you have to side with, with Montreal right now. I'm with Ollie. Jordan, are you going to make it a unanimous pre-vote sweep? I, I can't argue with Ollie. I can't argue with you. Um, just also the last two games, you're playing into Miami, the last one for Toronto FC, and then uh, Red Bulls as well, which I believe are seventh right now. Like They're not... <sighs> When you put Toronto FC in big situations, like we even saw it against Vancouver Whitecaps, 
and I thought they were great. But it also says something about a season and the team to play like your best and still not get it done. It means something. I know it was in pens, but either way, like a, a draw to the Red Bulls or or maybe my it still might not be enough, right? It's not in their control. They're not in the driver's seat. So again, we can get into this team. I thought they were in balance from the beginning, but it, it looks like they're gonna miss out on the playoffs. So I'd have to put money on see if Montreal to do it as opposed to TFC. All right, Jordan, let's leave your, your big, beautiful face right there because we're going to talk about that next. If TFC don't make the playoffs and we don't expect them to based on this conversation, how harshly are you judging John Herdman? Because obviously the goal was playoffs and there was this renewed optimism to start the season. The squad still on paper should be one of the most talented in Major League Soccer. I believe it's the second most expensive in Major League Soccer. If they fall short, how much can you put or how much responsibility can you put on the new coach's shoulders? I think he deserves a little bit, but I can't solely give it to him. One, I will say when everyone was singing his praises when they were having a, a good start to the season, I said it is a long year. And what I will say about this TFC team as well, that they're imbalanced. You have two big dogs in Bernadette and Antini that are making a boatload of money and those two players and a team. This is not basketball. And even in basketball, where you only play five players at a time, you put your two big dogs, anything can happen. You still need an army. This is football. This is soccer. You need a team that is balanced and everyone that can contribute. You're not going to go and, and bank on an Insigne who come into North America is predominantly injured a lot of the time. And then the product isn't the same. It's not a guy that that is scoring a, a goal a game or, or playing down a nine and just tearing up guys. He's not a a Giovinco type player. He's just not that person. So I think John Herdman, in many respects, there's been a lot going on about him um, and, and people have talked about, but I think in a coaching aspect, I think he he's done all right considering what he has. Like the team, I'm not slain. Obviously there, there are players on the squad that are more than competent, but it's just imbalanced. Like you look at defenders, them being injured, also their ages, midfielders, players that are coming in. Like, I look at this TFC team, and I can maybe compare it to, like, a, a 2018 TFC. Like, I'm looking at, at years that I've seen them play. If you were to take this TFC team and play other TFC teams in the past, they wouldn't compare, like, in, in the slightest way. Only last year, and everyone knows how, how abysmal that was. So, I think John Herdman's done – all right with what he has but i just think from the from the beginning he was he was treading water in the middle of the atlantic at some point though that current's gonna hit you and you're going to take in some water like he he you can't tread for that long you need a better and more balanced team oliver platt yeah i mean we all watched the the final guys and we all saw lorenzo insigne miss that chance late on in, in the game against chicago at the weekends like he can't put the ball in the net for this, this team. Like they, they showed up for that Canadian Championship final. They were ready. They looked organized. They looked like they had a game plan. They had Vancouver shifting around between formations in the first half to try and get a grip on the game. Like as a coach, I, I think he's doing his job to, to prepare this team and give them a chance. At some point, you have to turn it over to the players and say, your guy earning 15 million obviously has to do more. We've covered that. We, we don't need to go into that in any more depth there. But it's not just him, you know, it's center forward. He hasn't had a reliable player there all season, unfortunately. As much as I do think DeAndre Kerr has some promise, Prince Owusu had one period where he was hot and in form and they got some results off the back of that. But but the striker position hasn't been settled and they haven't had a consistent source of goals. So um, I, I really find it difficult to look at this group of players that he's got as much money as, as is there. Like Jordan said, it's not a balanced group. It's a group that's they've wasted a lot of money on players who who aren't as good as, as what they're earning. Uh, and I think he has basically maximized what I think what I thought this group could be. I thought it was a 12th, 13th place finish for TFC this season. Mm. They're up in eighth or ninth competing for, for that playing game. And I think that's a good enough job to to allow him the opportunity next season uh to, to reshape this team with with more players that are, are maybe more in his image. And from what Jason Hernandez has said. There's a lot of kind of cap dead weight coming off the books at the end of the season that will allow them to do that in a way that I don't think they're able to this season. So um, I think he's done a decent job. Like no one's going to say he's blown anyone out of the water, finishing where likely where they're going to finish and, and not winning the Canadian Championship. But I found it difficult to expect much more than this when I looked at, at the composition of this team. Who we have not spoken about yet is Vancouver Whitecaps, the three-time defending Canadian champions. They played the Portland Timbers, and they drew 1-1, an early goal. And in the end, they were able to get the point to see the X beside their name. They can also 
clinch an eighth Cascadia Cup on Wednesday when they play Seattle Sounders. Uh, with that clinch for Vancouver, and we talked in the lead up about um, Benny Sartini and where he sees this team going and the strides they've taken. I mean, this is now three times in four seasons since Sartini took over that the Caps have made the playoffs. They're also still, Ollie, chasing home field advantage. I mean, you look at the, the MLS playoff table right now, 30 games played. That is one fewer than everyone above them other than LAFC. Uh, they're only one point back of Houston, three back of Seattle, even more motivation for the Cascadian clash on Wednesday. Uh, where do you see them right now in this race? Do you think they have the horses to get up to hosting a playoff game? And how important is that actually for Vancouver and whatever playoff success they might find this year? I think in theory, this is the strongest group um, that they've had. Uh, maybe ever in, in their MLS history, mm. uh, certainly under Vanny Sartini. Like you look at, I know they didn't get the win at the weekends, but you look at the bench and, and the players they were able to bring on. Like there is no one on that bench who is a passenger. They brought an Adekubi, they brought an Armstrong, Caicedo, Ocampo, the new signing, Pedro Vite. They didn't have Ryan Gold and, uh, and Ali Ahmed. And, and that's where I think a little bit of my concern is with this team is just, are they going to be fully healthy at the right time of year? Because Brian White's come back from concussion. Gold is now seems to be struggling with something Ahmed, as I mentioned. So they need to get their best players fit and on the pitch in, in time for the biggest games of the season. But if they can do that, I think this is a really deep and, and varied group that does have the potential to to take that that next step uh, compared to what they've done in previous years. It's it's just a matter of time, I think, of firstly getting healthy enough to get the results they need the rest of the way to, to get that home advantage. And then obviously being primed and ready to go when it's playoff time. And if they can do that, I think this is an exciting team. They're defensively sound. Defensively sound, I think that's what you start with, right? I think also, too, Vanny Sartini deserves a lot of credit for, for building his team up gradually. I think when you have an identity that he obviously has, because if you watch him closely, you could see his imprint on his team. But then he's brought players in bit by bit, right? I, I think for at least 18 months before Armstrong was signed, I think we were kind of we all agreed to in, in some way, shape, or form that they needed a, another killer up top. They needed someone who could who could score goals. Um, I know they wanted to make it to before the deadline and then get that over the line, but they've added pieces and and boys to the team just at the right time. Um, and that's that's difficult to do because when you're looking at a squad, you know that you really rely on your 11, 12, 13. But I would say even their 19th player on their squad, as Ali alluded to contributes gives values like it's really that next man up attitude and i think also too when you're trying to compete for um an mls cup or just make a run in the playoffs the colder months and the last games and there needs to be some grit it's about your unit and and maybe it's not going to be gold's day but they seem to have other guys that can go and, and do the job but i'm looking at this team i think this is the best team that i've seen in recent years for vancouver whitecaps i think they can make a run i will also say it's just a little bit of luck as well like who you play at the time you play them are you fresh playoff stuff but i really back this vancouver whitecaps team they're the best team in canada for sure and it's that time of year when the playoffs are rolling around that we can debate things like playoff format and cpl supporters certainly love to do that mls supporters certainly love to do that i'm going to ask you two which you which format you prefer and obviously there is a large difference in the amount of teams in the respective leagues but in essence we understand the page playoff format that the cpl offers 1v2 winner goes to the final loser goes into the playoff bracket four five then the winner of that plays three. The winner of that plays the loser of match one. It's fairly straightforward, especially now that we have one year to wrap our brains around it. Uh, the other one being MLS. They have one through seven and then a wild card series. The wild card is two matches, giving a bit more benefit to the, the side that placed higher, finished higher in the season that year. And then a best of three or yeah, best of three series for the next round of the playoffs and then one offs all the way to the end. Jordan, what do you prefer of the two, assuming that all things were equal in terms of number of teams in the leagues, et cetera, but the actual idea of the playoffs? Well, well, that's the thing, right? This is an impossible question for me to really answer, but it's like if someone asks me, do I like mangoes here in Canada? Or do I like mangoes in Jamaica? I'm like, well, bring me to Jamaica. I'll definitely eat those. Maybe this analogy doesn't work, but I felt like it did when I started. <laughs> I just think it's difficult. Like I love the CPL format. I didn't love it at first. It took me a while. Maybe I'm just a creature of habit. But I, I like the way the CPL format is because, as I said, you're fifth place. You get a, get a ticket to the dance. 
but you have to do so much work uh, to, to have that Cinderella story. And I really do like the, the way that's prioritized. Um, the best of three, I've never really loved that situation in, in playoffs, uh, a situation like that. So I would say the CPL, CPL schedule or format really has my heart. Ali, I know you're a big fan of the CPL format, as am I. CPL by a mile. Um, but the main reason being that I think it greatly enhances the the regular season. Every place that you finish is is clearly better than the one below it. Uh, and that makes the whole year feel like the games are important and interesting and are worth watching as opposed to just uh, a few weeks at the end of the year. So no question for me, CPL. Yeah, and remember too where the league values or puts the the semantics of the end of year award winners too. The playoff winners are the league champions. The regular season champions are the regular season winners. So it really the the playoffs in the Canadian Premier League is an extension of the regular season with that other spot in Concacaf up for grabs um, instead of a separate standalone tournament, which I've always enjoyed. Why spend so much time on the regular season only to have a second standalone tournament? Never made sense for me. I really enjoy the way that it's working and. And you're right. You get a chance if you're the lower seeds, but you really have to work for it to be league champions at the end of the year. Uh, Jordan, I love that analogy, by the way. I feel the same way about cherries in New I Zealand make versus cherries in here. I can eat a bucket of New Zealand cherries when I'm hanging out in Auckland. I will not touch a cherry anywhere but other than from the Are South they dramatically Islanders. better in Jamaica? Yes. Dramatically really? better. Much like Fruit the CPL just... league format for all of our players. Yes. Uh, time to get to our Visa Women's Football Report. <laughs> Presented by Visa, the Women's Football Report. So many tributes, so many words of congratulations have been pouring in since Christine Sinclair announced that this would be her final year in the club game. Oliver Platt, I think we've seen all of the tributes. Uh, each and every one of us at One Soccer are fortunate to have had individual memories with Christine over the years and, and the final years of her international career. Uh, what are you going to take away as maybe a favorite moment or, or a, a word of legacy for the greatest footballer of all time in many people's eyes? Yeah, I just think seeing Christine Sinclair retire and, and obviously Alex Morgan um, shortly before that, like it, it just kind of marks for me, this was the generation of players that really brought the club game uh, to the forefront and, and made it sustainable and made it something that you look at now and, and, and it's going to last because you can look back at Christine Sinclair's early career and some of the clubs she played for that no longer exist, um, how up and down it was, how unstable it was at times um, in the club game compared to the international game, which obviously already had some some profile. Um, that to me is is what these players will be remembered for, as well as obviously their play on the field and all their their individual achievements. Is just making women's club soccer resemble a lot more of, of the men's game in terms of its future and, and and in terms of how strong it is now. So it's uh, yeah, it's a massive massive impact that's going to completely change things for the next generation. I'm going to cheat a little bit because this was an international achievement more so than club, but I'll never forget being there when she broke the record and how so many different media outlets uh, converged on McAllen, Texas, basically at the Mexican border. And all anyone wanted to talk about was Christine Sinclair, which to be fair is Christine's nightmare, but she handled it with the typical grace uh, that she always did. It was such a treat to have the first interview with her after the match, seeing her teammates with the goat masks and the celebrations they had. And it just really showed do you with all of the players coaches media everyone involved in the game paying tribute to her then uh, it was like okay this this is something special and i'm just glad that she was able to celebrate the final years of her international and playing career so christine from all of us at one soccer we'll miss seeing you on the pitch we also know that you won't be going too far and your legacy will just transition as opposed to end today's visa women's football report and now on to the tony bed topics Some UEFA odds for Tony Bet today. It's literally just one question and one club match for each person. Jordan Wilson, Dortmund minus 209 Celtic, and Alistair Johnston plus 520. Dortmund's not losing this one, even though Come Celtic. Come on, live a little. Nah. Could have given him Arsenal, decided not to. Going to give Oliver Platt and Lille at plus 500 hosting Real Madrid. Johnny David, perfect hat trick. Give me, give me a little on the handicap. Johnny David to get a goal. Uh, and maybe a maybe a draw for Lil that will deliver you a win on the handicap. How about that? Love that. That's yeah, how about that, Oliver Platt. Love that. We got to get out of here. Thanks for all. Thanks to all for joining us. Thanks to Ollie and Jordan Evan Adam Jenkins. See you next time on One Soccer Today.